Hello, and welcome to our second lecture in Module 6. We just finished talking about a basic introduction, uh, uh, introduction sorry, to some issues uh, that will come up in our discussions of everyday memory. I want to take a few minutes to talk about what's called source memory and source monitoring, because this is an important part of everyday aspects of memory, is trying to remember where we are trying to figure out where we know a memory from, and that's what we mean by source memory. So we'll start with a discussion of what source memory is, talk about source monitoring. We'll then talk about a phenomenon called cryptonesia, or cryptoamnesia, depending on who you ask, which is a phenomenon related to what's called unconscious plagiarism. And then we'll finish up with a little brief uh, introduction to some studies and applications of source memory. So let's start off by talking about what source memory is. And source memory is the process of determining the origins of our memories. Relatively straightforward. This comes directly from a paper, a classic paper, introducing what's called the source monitoring framework. Um, or the term source refers to a variety of characteristics that collectively specify the conditions under which a memory is acquired, such as the spatial, temporal, and social context of the event, the media and modalities through which it was perceived. Basically, all of the contextual details and then some is essentially what we can think about this as. So you can think of context as sort of the when and where, um, certainly, and then maybe the source would be the when, where, as well as the who. So we were all out at um, a bar together, whatever bar you might want it to be, um, and we were all talking about the election, and so now we're at the context, and then Bob said this and Mary said this. That would be the source of those memories. So that's what we're talking about. So the what, the who, what, where, and when. Sorry, the who's missing from that, my apologies. Uh, not the what, what of memory, but the what, who, what, where, and when uh, of memory. So uh, that's essentially what we're talking about when we talk about source memories. Where did that memory come from? And sometimes the source might be inside your head and outside your head. And that's become a, gonna become important in our next lecture in this uh, module. So smore, sort of the, I almost said s'mores monitoring. Source monitoring refers to the set of processes involved in making attributions about the origins of memories. So source monitoring is based on memory characteristics established when the memory was formed, such as perceptual information, contextual information, semantic detail, affective information, and cognitive operations. All of the stuff that goes into trying to figure out where did this memory come from. And we make a lot of what we call source monitoring errors, where we misidentify the source of a memory. And that's going to become really important when we talk in our next lecture about suggestibility and reconstructive processes in memory. So this becomes a really important uh, thing to think about when we start thinking about uh, how we can um, understand how memory works. So we'll see that we often mistake things that aren't just happening inside our own head uh, with things that actually happen. And particularly when kids are younger, this is particularly problematic. So we have a, a phenomenon called imagination inflation, which if you imagine doing something enough times, you can actually begin to believe it happened. And so that's a really important thing to think about. Children are particularly bad at source monitoring. Source monitoring is accomplished primarily by the frontal lobes. And so early in development, children really have a difficult time often uh, identifying the correct source of a memory. So that's what we mean by source monitoring. So this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, Good writer, writers borrow from other writers, great writers steal outright. Uh, this is a famous line from The West Wing, which Aaron, Stor uh, Storkin, Aaron Sorkin stole from T.S. Eliot. Um, and the reason I bring this quote up is it's really directly related to crypto cryptonesia, or cryptoamnesia, depending on who you ask. Uh, but cryptonesia is the unconscious plagiarism of another's work due to a lack of recognition of its original source. Uh, as I said in the uh, basic introduction, this is oftentimes what we call unconscious plagiarism. There's a long history of this question of unconscious plagiarism. Uh, certainly, um, there is a very famous story about Sigmund Freud stealing his theories on bisexuality from a friend and then finally acknowledging that, in fact, it probably did come from the friend. 
Um, and this, as we get older, starts to get difficult as well. And so it's a pretty important thing to think about. This is very similar to what we call source amnesia, in which we cannot recall the correct source of a memory. However, we do know it was an external source. So for example, um, I remember reading this somewhere. So I know I read it, so you remember the content, but I have no idea where it came from, where you read it, who said it, any of that sort of thing. Um, and that's an important part of understanding in mean, this kind of everyday memory. Cryptomnesia is a really difficult thing to deal with, particularly in academia, because we read so much, and people read so much and write so much. Um, now, what was intentionally plagiarized versus what was unconsciously plagiarized? Well, I think if it's word for word, verbatim, probably pretty clear that's <laughs> plagiarism. Although people certainly have very clear memories of, of things and maybe even will write the exact same sentence. Really difficult issue to deal with, uh, but it's certainly... Um, not uncommon. So finally, quick introduction to some studies and applications of source memory. Uh, great study by um, Host and Pezdek. Kathy Pezdek's done some really terrific work uh, in uh, jury, jury memory and jury decision making. Um, and in this study, uh, participants listened to a recording of a mock trial, and then one week later they were asked to recall the details of the trial. What they found is 15% of participants recalled events that were not stated but were consistent with the crime. So uh, the basic idea here is, let's say it's a convenience store robbery, and there's a description of the robbery that includes nothing about a weapon. But your cognitive schema of what a convenience store robbery looks like is that there's probably a weapon. So in your mind, you're picturing probably what's happening, and you've added that weapon already. Certainly when you retrieve information uh, from that uh, recording, you're probably going to retrieve that along with it. Uh, this increases to 25% if they're given any misleading information by an attorney. Things like, did you see the weapon? That simple question. And even if the person says no, that misleading information that there might have been a weapon can uh, change memory. It's a very uh, great study. There's another study uh, on trying to diminish people's beliefs in myths about the flu shot. Flu shots are very important, particularly for older adults. CDC discovered that their efforts to dispel myths were particularly um, failing, and so a group of people put together a study and looked at um, what was happening in older adults, and what they found was that they could present them with a pamphlet that says, you know, that was basically CDC dispels flu myths, and here's the myth, and here's why it's wrong, here's the myth, and here's why it's wrong. A week later, they remember the myth, only now they remember the CDC telling them that the myth was true, rather than the CDC trying to get rid of the myth. And that's a particularly problematic problem, particularly problematic problem, that's particularly problematic in this era of fake news. So trying to remember where something came from, uh, and trying to remember if it was a credible source or not. And even if you're trying to dispel the fake news, now if you're talking about fake news and real news, now you might believe, remember the fake news and believe it came from the real news source. It's a huge problem that we're going to have to figure out how to fix, but uh, I don't have any great solutions for you, but it's something certainly to think about. Well, that gets us to the end of this very quick introduction of source and source memory. Um, plenty of people doing extensive work in this area, but I just wanted to introduce some of the ideas before we get into suggestibility and reconstruct processes in memory, because source memory becomes an important part of that. So we'll pick up that topic uh, in our next lecture.